<clears throat> it got to the place where I thought, this is not really good. So I leaned over to Jeff Maines and said, you know, we need, you need to get him off the microphone soon or he will destroy whatever good we may have done over the last hour with these questions. It seems like there's a kind of a fear towards those people here that who could have the same thought or if have the same film or if have the disease, you should fear those people, but you should, you know, not necessarily fear those people. <laughs> And I think what was interesting about Gaetan's attitude towards that is that in a way he did not want to change his sexual behavior because there was no clear proof. And so again, I think because he was, a, he was this target for so many people, he was, say, he was saying to them, prove to me that this is how you get it. And then I'll change my behavior. But until you can prove that, I'm not going to change anything. I remember after one medical setback, holding him in his apartment and him telling me that he wasn't afraid of being dead. He was just scared of dying. He never expressed any great sense that life had been unjust. He just seemed determined to make the best of whatever time he had left. I thought it was very brave of him to still be working. He'd taken some time off and then he'd come back. I think that was, he came back for a last period. And when he did come back, he actually looked great. He was in a good mood, giggling like he always did, darling. Gaetan was having trouble making it to flights and he was booking off last minute because he was starting to feel too ill to work. More than anything, he wanted to keep flying. He didn't want to be booked off sick. He loved flying, that was his family, that was his freedom. We didn't know who would survive this or who wouldn't survive this it was possible that you know things were going to work for him and so uh, consequently i just met him in that spirit and you know we both giggled and as we were giggling i just you know uh touched up his makeup because i could see that it hadn't been properly applied you know it was too cakey as well. I remember it being too cakey more than not covering the legion he'd covered the legion but you know just a softer look. <laughs> that was the last time I saw him. I didn't see him after that. the success of the cluster study was the cooperation of Case 57, Gaetan Dugas, whose personal sexual network extended to a large number of men in many cities. For me, the cluster study um, is a very interesting landmark scientifically, because it really helped um, convince the world that this was a sexually transmitted disease, because here you have this cluster of patients who are connected by lines which reflect sexual contact. So this shows 40 men who were eventually linked by sexual contact by their diagnosis. And the person who connected cases from both the West and the East is shown in the middle of this diagram. And he has links to eight different men, four on the West Coast, four on the East Coast. This is the person that we called the out of California case. Later on, we tried to show these cases by early onset, and you'll see that this out of California case was one of two, four, six, who had symptom onset before 1980. So he was an early case, but he wasn't necessarily the earliest case in this cluster of 40 different men. He originally was called patient 57, then patient O for out of California case. And that's the way it was shown and displayed to my colleagues at CDC. A few months later, everybody's talking about patient zero. And I don't know what they're talking about. Who are you talking about? Patient zero. Come on, Daryl, you were the one who told us about him. I told you about patient 57 or the out of California case. Patient O, 
Oh, that was an O? We thought it was a zero. The zero lost the association uh, with out of California and then began to communicate other meanings, particularly the association with zero as absolute beginning, but one with profound consequences for how the term was subsequently understood. I think right now AIDS is nine parts politics and one part science. So writing about the science and the elegant genetics of the AIDS virus misses the point. The point right now is we're not getting treatments because of political problems, and that's not being written about. I think it's important to say that until the epidemic started occurring outside of the gay community, that the mainstream media largely wasn't paying attention to it. You've got to remember that the problem here is that we're moving slow in a situation where the enemy is time, because the more time you give an epidemic, the more it's going to spread. In the early 80s, Randy Schultz was the only newspaper reporter writing regularly about the spreading AIDS epidemic. And I think I felt more of a responsibility uh, and a determination to report on AIDS, because to me AIDS wasn't something that just happened to other people. It happened to, to people I knew and I care about. He felt that he was the only person that could report on this, that could deal with this and, and highlight it and show what it was becoming, because uh, none of the other media outlets were reporting on it. I was very proud of him. He forced the Chronicle to let him cover it when virtually I, there was nobody else covering it, basically on a daily, weekly basis. When you go back to the history, the alpha and the omega of the AIDS epidemic is the Rock Hudson diagnosis. That awakens the public and really awakens the media. The media starts covering it. I think it was also perceived at the time that Rock Hudson was heterosexual, which he wasn't. And people said, well, if Rock Hudson could get it, I could get it. What happens then is a story of, of national failure, and it gets to the central thesis of my book, which is that AIDS didn't just happen, it was allowed to happen. And the band played on as a natural outgrowth, really, of the articles that Randy's writing at the San Francisco Chronicle. I think he could see that this was an issue bigger than a, what a daily newspaper could cover. Randy Schultz really went out of his way to um, carefully document in detail, in excruciating detail, the moral, ethical, and criminal negligence of the Reagan administration. Randy Schultz came to CDC as a newspaper reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle early in the epidemic and interviewed a number of us, Jim, me, and others. He attended virtually every AIDS meeting in the United States. He was always there and always interviewing people. I mean, I was probably interviewed by him dozens of times. He asked me a lot of questions about the cluster study and patient zero and so forth. And Randy Schultz did what any good reporter would do in tracking down patient zero. Well, here's a story of this guy that's coming to San Francisco and being identified, the, the hotlines lighting up, people are talking about him all over town. What journalist wouldn't try to find out who that was? I've talked to Marcus Kona about this and he confirms that Randy asked him several times, was narrowing things down slowly, and then called him back and said, I don't need your help, I've figured out who it is. Schultz's interview notes are headed with a boxed inscription, Gayton is patient zero. I remember the moment that Randy became aware of Gayton and how all the charts <laughs> came back to him. The researchers from the CDC were able to track down Gaetan, and through his cooperation, and he was very cooperative with the CDC researchers, were able to establish sexual links between 40 of the first 248 gay men who were diagnosed with AIDS in the United States. That's when I realized not only was he going to use my name and the name, names of other government employees, but he was also going to name patients. And I told him, no, don't do this. This is not a good idea. You shouldn't name patient zero. Randy responded, I've got to do it. The government's not going to do anything about this problem unless I name names. By using everybody's name in this book, and I use everybody's name, he's not singled out at all, I think I make it put the disease on much more of a human scale. The publicist working on the book 
A young woman named Diane came up to my office on Friday afternoon in tears saying, we're going to, you know, we're not going to get any publicity. Everybody thinks it's been covered. They don't want to cover it. They're seeing it mainly as an attack on the Reagan administration and on the medical establishment, the CDC. I panicked. I called up an ex-boyfriend of mine who happened to be a publicist, and I said, John, I know you're out of work, so you have time on your hands. I'm in big trouble. I need you to spend the weekend reading this manuscript. And he suggested the following, which I thought was extraordinarily clever. The band played on. The story of Patient Zero comes up on 11 pages out of a 620-page book. He's only mentioned in 11 pages. And he said, you pull this material out, you gather it together, and you present it to the New York Post, a miserably homophobic newspaper. The story has everything they want. It has beauty, it has death. You know, he's an airline steward, and best of all, he's a foreigner. He said, they're going to eat it up. Randy hated the idea. I called him Monday night after talking with my friend, and he was appalled. And he said, you know, this is yellow journalism. I said, yeah. But I said, if we don't do this, you're going to sell four or 5,000 copies of this book, basically to gay people. It's going to have no impact, you know, on the media. It's going to have no impact on the national uh, medical establishment. And it's not going to do what the function of this book is to do, which is to put this on the national agenda. And he finally agreed very, very reluctantly. And we presented it to the Post, and they fell for it. It was like cultural judo, where you were using the strength of your enemy to get your own end. And essentially, that's what we did. I mean, he, pred he told me exactly the headline. The man who gave us AIDS. When I received this phone call, I just happened to pick up the phone in the newsroom, and uh, this young woman from 60 Minutes uh, named Barbara Drury, um, researcher-producer, I think was her role, um, explained that uh, they were doing a documentary and that one of the main characters in it was from Quebec City, and she needed someone to drive her to Quebec City from Montreal and to translate with the family. And on the way, she had a copy of Randy Schultz's book, and the band played on. And that's when the true horror of the story was revealed to me that uh, that they were preparing a documentary based on this book and this book had evidence that the man who brought AIDS to North America, the gay man who'd done that, was Gaetan Dugas and that he was from a suburb of Quebec City. When I walked in the door of the house, it was very clear to me early on that this was a family who really loved this young man and um, who were very sorrowful about his death and they were asking me, what, you know, what do you think we should do? I remember them asking me that. And, and I said, well, you do one interview, you're going to have everyone lined up here at your door. They were horrified when they learned that this book that was coming out was going to name Gaetan as the patient zero. Kai Babineau who interviewed me, I mean, he asked me, had I ever thought of the impact it would have on Gitan's family and his friends? And I had to honestly say, no, I hadn't. I, I can only say I think they must have had a really difficult time going through the bad press after, which I think is, you know, shocking. I mean, I find that to be a crime nearly. And his family must have suffered after his demise for a long period of time. I remember his sister, who was a dental hygienist, saying, um, you know, so that's the reward he gets for cooperating with the researchers. 